All right, perfect. So um, thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Mike. Um, my name is Brian Conant. I'm the director of the LPFA, and I've got some good news to share, hopefully tonight. Um, we usually, LPFA usually hosts dozens, maybe three dozen volunteer projects per year. We normally get about 10 to 15,000 hours of volunteer time from the volunteer projects. This past year, we weren't able to do anything due to COVID. But I got some good news from the Forest Service that they are going to be supporting smaller scale volunteer projects moving forward. And um, so I'm going to be sending in to them some, some paperwork to uh, move forward with, with a pretty robust schedule of volunteer trail projects over the next couple months here during the, the spring season and into early summer. Um, if you haven't been on any volunteer plus, we do a lot of trail work. Uh, we're out there doing cross-cut work to clear out trees from the trails. We, we, we brush the trails, work on tread. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we do have access uh, through the Forest Service to drive on administrative roads that gets us into, into special spots in the forest, which is really, really nice. Uh, we also have certain projects where we utilize volunteers um, that have either goats or mules to help bring in some supplies, which is really convenient for us as well. So. Uh, we're real excited to get started here and um, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed um, that uh, COVID or, you know, does what it's supposed to do and we're able to, to, uh, to carry out these, these volunteer projects. So, uh, Kendra, do you have that sheet of paper? I'm going to do it. All right. So I won't go over all of these, but just a couple of them, maybe uh, just to get you guys excited about doing some, some of the trail work here. Um, we're gonna to try to kick this off with a, a late March project down to Four Bush Camp in Santa Barbara Front Country. It's on the backside of the Front Country. Um, again, these are gonna be a limited number, so we'll probably have a, a, like 10 to 15 people maximum. No sharing of food, uh, but but it's a good opportunity to get out there and and uh, and help us out with the trails. Um, one of our big focuses is also gonna be on the Medolce Trail. We have two projects scheduled to either to work the Medolce or the Upper Sisquoc. I was on these trails last week, the Medolce in particular, and there's over 70 trees down in the first mile of the trail from Medolce Camp up towards uh, the Buckhorn Road. Uh, it's a, a beautiful part of the forest. Uh, you're about 5,000 feet or so. This is part of the Condor Trail, and most of the work up there is going to be uh, using crosscut saws to cut out some, some trees that have fallen across the trail. Um, we also have projects up in San Luis Obispo. We're on the American Canyon Trail and be able, being able to have access to American Canyon. Um, any of you up in San Luis, that's that's a special treat to get in there as well. Um, then we're going to be doing a stock supported project out to White Ledge to work on the, the eastern side of the Hurricane Deck Trail. Um, and then as we head into uh, later in the spring, we're gonna be, we have two projects up in Pieter Blanca working on the Gene Marshall Pieter Blanca Trail. Actually, we have three. Of them. Um, the first one is going to be at Pieter Blanca Camp. And we're going to be doing some crosscut work and, and some other stuff up there that should be a lot of fun. And then one of our bigger projects is um, the last one I'll talk about tonight is a, a 10 day working vacation we have on the Indian Creek Trail, uh, which is in the Dick Smith Wilderness in, in Santa Barbara backcountry. And that's a real special one as well. We'll be able to drive out to Mono. And then from there, it's a five mile backpack into Meadow Camp, which will be our, our base for the week. And from there, we'll be doing every every sort of trail work imaginable from from there up towards Indian Creek Camp. Um, and it's a five mile backpack, pretty easy. It will be stock supported. So we'll have a lot of uh, conveniences there as well. So anyway, um, as I mentioned, these are a lot of fun. Um, we'll be publish publishing and, and publicizing these um, working vacations and other volunteer projects, both on social media and in an email. So keep, uh, keep an eye out for them. Um, hope you can make them. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can email us at info at lpforest.org. And um, I'll pass it off. I can't on, but uh, probably best to hand it off to you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you, Kendra, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, my name's uh, Mike. You just call me Mike. And I'm just going to go ahead and dive into it. And just want to say thanks again. If you have any questions, I think probably if you you can just go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and, and interrupt me and blurt them out and I'll do my best to respond. And if things get a little crazy, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pull on the hooks. But otherwise I'd say, just go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, shout it out. Or if you prefer, you can type into your question into the chat box and 
we'll be able to respond in that way. And by the way, we've uh, added some links that you're going to find useful, I think, to the chat box uh, at this time. So Kendra has been kind enough to do that. I think they're pinned at the top. And if the links don't work by clicking on them, you can just copy them and paste them into your uh, browser. So we'll go ahead and thumbs up. Can you see the screen? Thumbs up. OK, we're going to go ahead and get into this. And you know, we all have our own connection to the Los Padres. And mine goes back many, many years. When I was a grad student at UCSB um, back in the late 1980s, and you know, it was just, I discovered the Los Padres as I'm sure each one of you has or will. And it was, it, it was unlike any other wilderness I've come into. I've, I was thinking about how I would begin tonight's presentation. And it's, it's, in some ways it's difficult because it's such an emotional connection. But this is a night um, a photograph from uh, Piedra Blanca that uh, Brian was just telling us about. And you can see a bit of the Milky Way there in the sky. You can see the moon off to the right. And I'm going to be talking about this image and many others like it during this, this evening. But it, to me, this is just one of so many experiences in the Los Padres that are just so meaningful to me personally. It's, it's sort of the, the, you know, there's a, it's the just right wilderness. It's not too extreme. It's not too tame. It's, it's sort of just right. And the best part is that you can, <laughs> I think all of us have found you can pretty much get away from folks and just get your dose of solitude. So briefly about me, I won't spend much time on this. Uh, I'm a full-time astrophotographer. I'm an author. I'm a teacher. Uh, these are my two books. You can find links to the two books in the in the chat. Um, they're on nightscape photography, landscape astrophotography, and time lapses. I uh, teach to. I'm an instructor in the Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, the Brian Peterson School of Photography, and uh, I've got you know commercial licenses available and a weekly show on slu.com on nightscapes. I'm very proud to be a delegate to the International Dykes Dark Sky Association. And before my, you know, <laughs> astronomy photography career took off, I was a physics and an astronomy professor and chair for quite some time, and also an applied physics research scientist for quite some time. So, um, total science geek, but that's kind of my frame of mind where I've been coming from. So, you know, when we talk about nightscape photography or landscape astrophotography, what really is it? You know, this is a an engagement shoot from a couple of friends of ours from a few years back, and to me. You know, anything that has an interesting night sky with an interesting foreground would be considered a nightscape image. And it's very similar to a landscape image in that the attention is all about the foreground. And the only real difference between a, a nightscape and a landscape is a nightscape has a night sky. And there's all kinds of different types of, you know, nightscape image projects that you can do within the Los Padres. Uh, I'm going to go through a few examples here from areas that are obviously not the Los Padres, but, you know, stars and constellations. Here you can see the constellation Orion, beautifully framed by this arch in Arches National Park. Uh, different colors of stars, Betelgeuse over here, Bellatrix over here, Rigel down here. I mean, just learning about the stars is such a fascinating uh, facet of astronomy. And there's so, the more, it's one of these things, the more you, you, you learn, the more you, it, more interesting it becomes. It's like any type of a, any type of the natural world that all of us have our interest in. Star trails are, can be done any clear night of the year, you know, any phase of the moon, any month of the year. They're so easy to do once you understand the basic process and they're just so captivating because they really illustrate the motion of the earth, which causes the, of course, the objects in the night sky to appear to move. This is a north facing star trail. So right at the very center here, the very, very center is the uh, the axis of rotation of the Earth. And this bright little star right just there, that little segment is Polaris or the North Star. And because it's so close to the axis of rotation, the North Celestial Pole, um, it doesn't really move very much as you can see. And it's, you know, if you draw a straight line down from that point to the horizon, this is due North. And then all the other stars, of course, rotate in a counterclockwise direction around that point. So star trails are super fun to do. Everyone's favorite is the Milky Way. You can see the summer Milky Way, looks a bright galactic core. You can see some bright, look at these, these bright glowing red things. What are those? Those are kind of neat. And how about this thing right here? This, is, this isn't red, this is kind of a white thing. And this thing over here and these dark things, what are those? Well, this is the beautiful thing is by studying these, these, uh, these sites that you can see from dark sky locations like the Los Padres, you can really gain insights as to what's, you know, the structure of the universe and how things are, are uh, put together and it, it just never gets old. This is Jupiter, by the way, rising 
This is looking east, everything's rising over the horizon. Meteor showers are another great thing to plan. These happen very reliably on the same dates each year as the Earth passes through the debris field left behind behind comets. Really a cool thing. This is in Yosemite National Park uh, from Tunnel View. You can re recognize El Cap over here. This is the Perseids, so the constellation Perseus, and all the meteors seem to be coming out of here. So meteor showers are super fun, uh, you know, activities for um, just connecting with the cosmos. And then here we have, uh, I'm just going to call this planetary alignments. And we had a great, you know, the great conjunction in December 21st between Jupiter and Saturn. But here, all the planets except for Mercury are visible. We have Venus. We've got Uranus, we've got Mars, we've got Neptune, Saturn and Jupiter, Pluto's even there, you know, even though it's not visible. And the amazing thing about planetary alignments is when you have something as, as spectacular as this, where all the planets almost are above the horizon, they appear curved because of the nature of this photograph. But when you're in the field, they're just lined up in a line. And you really can see the planar nature of the solar system and how uh, everything is put together. Now, of course, this is a, you know, you can also create your own light. This is something that's really easy to do with, you know, flashlights or headlights or a variety of light painting tools. This is just a tube uh, I picked up at a local hardware store um, with some parchment paper rolled up inside with a little headlamp at the end. And you just kind of wave it around in a little, um, you know, for a few seconds during a long exposure. And you can create these really cool, um, you know, patterns that are uh, a lot of fun to play with. And this is something that, again, can be done you know, on any type of condition. This was a moonlit night. You can see some stars up here, but you know, light painting and light drawing are a lot of fun to, to do at night. And um, you know, there's some very, very creative uh, uh, folks out there doing that. Now I've included this one. This is taken from almost downtown Minneapolis. And the point here is if you look right where I've got my cursor, that little smudge is the Andromeda galaxy. So this is the furthest away thing that you can see with your naked eye. It's a couple million, little over, two million light years away. So the light that you see there left that galaxy two million years ago and spent all the time since then traveling to my camera when it came into my camera and, and registered its image. But it's so bright that you can easily see it with an unaided eye, especially in a dark sky location. So, you know, there's just so many things to, to see. The Andromeda galaxy is one of them that you can capture along with all these other stars that are inside our own Milky Way. Now, a little closer to home, of course, we have the full moon. This is taken um, actually off Chesborough Canyon Road near uh, a couple of the folks who I know are on the on the call this evening. And you know, lining up the full moon, it's it's so much fun to do this, and it's so satisfying to see the full moon slowly make its appearance and come above the horizon. And it's just a it's a gripping gripping um, thing to see. And then finally, of course, 2020 was the year of the comet. I mean, this is just a spectacular. Um, uh, event that happened this last summer in 2020. We had Comet Neowise. This is a shot of the comet along with the Aurora Borealis here in, uh, in Minnesota. So this is something to always keep an eye on. And to help you with this, I put together this real simple guide that you can download from one of the links that's in the chat box. I think it's called the 2021 guide or something like that. Uh, it's just a you know, couple page download um, PDF uh, thing. And what it shows is by month, and we're gonna go through this, uh, some of this this evening, as much as we can. This is the uh, by month in the in the leftmost column. And then this is what I'm recommending as a constellation that you might be interested in learning more about. Like for example, now we're in March, Orion is going to be pretty close to the horizon. Um, and you'll be able to see this, uh, you know, setting and, um, you know, these other uh, constellations and stars as well. And then, then we have the full moon dates and the crescent moon dates and um, you know the planets and meteor showers and Milky Way course. We're going to go through all that here tonight, I hope. And in particular, uh, this is the overall agenda that was advertised in the, um, in the description. We're going to talk about why is the Los Padres so great for night sky observing. I want to talk briefly about the effects of light pollution, some of the things all of us can do to help mitigate this. I think we all have an environmental steward component to all of us. I want to help in this, in this regard. Um, I want to go through the best monthly night sky objects to observe and photograph, how to develop a plan. And then I want to talk about the photography, if, if we have enough time, the camera settings, some of the gear you can use, how to set everything up and get a focus and composition, and then finally wind up with some best practices and some methods. So it's a lot to do. I hope we can get through this. Uh, if not, I'm happy to come back on another occasion. But this is, this is I, I like to start here. This is, of course, uh, the Earth. 
uh, you know, satellite imagery from NASA, publicly available, really cool stuff you can search for. And what this shows is the lights from uh, human, you know, human occupied areas that are giving off light. So cities, obviously, and towns and villages and so forth. And it's really striking because you can really see how much light is just being, you know, shone straight up into space. And in fact, if we zoom in on the United States, there's really some interesting things to see here. So again, these are actual uh, photographs taken uh, by satellites, you know, put together into a montage. And you know, you can see Southern California here, the Bay Area. Um, I'm actually here in, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. That's where I am right now. St. Paul, or Chicago, and so forth. And it's kind of interesting because you can see this thing right here and you might ask yourself, well, there's no city um, in the middle of North Dakota. And you're right, those are just uh, you know, oil flares from the uh, oil uh, uh, activity there. And there's all this, but the point is that all this light sort of shines up into space and what effect this has on not only human health, but just the overall ecosystem, kind of similar what happens is that when you have a headlight in fog, and you can see how the fog really scatters the, the light and shines it in all different directions, back in, back in the direction of the driver, off to the side, we can see the, the fog, the, the, you know, the, you can see this light even though we're not in line with the lights directly. And so what happens then is, this is, if we go back to the map of the United States, I, don't, I put down here in the lower left-hand corner, uh, lightpollutionmap.info, I'm referring to this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in the effects of that light scattering. And what happens is that the lights that you saw before from this type of effect, where you just have these very discrete, you can actually see the, you know, the interstates spread out in the roads connecting the towns and the cities and so forth. And when that light um, actually shines up into the air and spreads out, it just like this effect of the headlights, it creates these what we call light domes over these populated areas. And these light domes spread sideways and also vertically pretty extensively. So I'm sure many of you have heard about this, but this is something that is a, a real issue in, um, in, in how it affects the environment, like I say, in, in ecosystems, you know, birds and insects and mammals and just pretty much everything ourselves. And these different colors correspond to the different uh, darknesses and brightnesses. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanna introduce the Bortle scale. If you've never heard about this, this was came up with this person back in um, 20 years ago in Sky and Telescope Magazine. There's a reference if you'd like to look that up. And it is a very, it's a quantitative way of characterizing the, the brightness of the, the night sky. I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about that. Um, you can get this map yourself as well as anywhere else in the world at lightpollutionmap.info. It's a great resource. And of course, what I want to do now is zoom in on our neck of the woods, our area of interest in, you know, in southern central California. And you can see, if we zoom in, you can see Phoenix, you can see Las Vegas, Sacramento, Bay Area, LA, and San Diego, and so forth. And you can also see these islands of darkness. You can see Death Valley, you can see the Mojave, you can see the Grand Canyon and the Sierra. And of course, you can also see the Los Padres. And this is where I want to turn now in our talk this evening in how the sky quality in the Los Padres um, is, uh, how, how, how good of a sky quality it really is. So I'm now gonna zoom in on this area. And so here we have it, we're in the Southern Los, Los, Los Padres. I'm not gonna be talking about the Northern part, but just as good, if not better. But this is an, a part of the, the Los Padres I think many of us are, are very active in and very familiar with. And as you start to do that same sort of overlaying, you can see here that it's actually pretty good. I mean. The, most of the Los Padres has kind of a, it falls into this kind of a blue, I've outlined, let's say, this is, <laughs> this is Mike on PowerPoint outlining the thing. So it's, it's, not, it's not perfect, but it's, it's lack of perfection is not, it's not um, it doesn't mean anything. But the outline here you can see, I mean, most of the Los Padres, as you can see, has a bordal value of in the sort of in the blues and some of the greens and touching in some of the yellows and oranges down here uh, towards, you know, Santa Barbara and Ojai and, in uh, Santa Paul and so forth, and up here uh, getting close to Bakersfield and things. But it's most of it's pretty good. So I want to talk a little bit about this and to help you really guide your thinking, like, why is this important? Mike, Mike, why are you talking about this? Well, the portal scale, just so you know, is a reflection of how bright is the sky. What's the natural sky brightness ratio? So a Bortle scale of one has a sky brightness factor of one. It's, it's as dark as the natural sky gets. 
and then it's it's not sort of a it's sort of maybe sort of a logarithmic or some type of a, a not linear scale. And as the Bortle number increases, you can see, you know, for a Bortle scale of five, the, the sky is 10 times as bright as a naturally dark, bright, dark, dark sky. For a Bortle scale of eight to nine, it can be as 500 or a thousand times as bright as a naturally dark night sky. So this is a, a way of really gauging how bright is the sky and the effects of this on what we care about from a night photography point of view or astronomy point of view is, you know, can we see the Milky Way? And with these portal scales of six and above, not really. You, know, you start to see parts of this, this Milky Way. I'm gonna show you some examples here in a minute. And then also look at this, the number of stars visible in the entire sky at the very top of the scale, if you're in you know, downtown LA or Manhattan or, or someplace or San Francisco, you might only see half a dozen stars in the entire sky because all of the other the dimmer star, they're still there, but the sky glow itself is, is blocking their light. Um, but then when you start to get down to the Bortle in the Los Padres zone of you know two to three to four, you can see thousands of stars in the night sky and that's what makes it so appealing. So just to give you a sense of what we've got going on, this is uh, not the Los Padres, but just a, 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 an illustrative example. So if you have a Bortle scale of a Bortle class two, this is what the Milky Way looks like this last summer. This was a project I was doing. I've indicated a couple of uh, notable features on Taurus here in Scorpius. And this is Saturn, or, you know, Saturn and Jupiter right over here. But then if we go to a Bortal scale of four, same portion of the Milky Way, a few nights later, again, Saturn and Jupiter. But this is the sky glow of uh, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And you can see how the, you can, the Milky Way is still there, but it's just, it's, it's not as bright as the, as the air itself, this dome of light over the urban areas. And then this is an even brighter area, a sky glow of six. You've almost completely lost the Milky Way. And so when you put all this stuff together, this is kind of a calibration, um, a, cal a calibration slide, if you will, to illustrate the effects of, uh, of sky glow on the night sky and how the fact is that the Los Padres has a fairly dark sky. It's, like I can say it's blue, greenish. So most of the Los Padres is in this sort of a zone on the left where you can see much, much of the structure of the Milky Way. And you do, as you get closer to these urban areas, you do have, you know, some loss of visibility, but anyway, there it is. So that's the, uh, <laughs> that was the message of the thing. So when you start thinking about, you know, what can you see in the Los Padres, then you can see from the uh, comparison of the Bortle scale that you can see a lot of, you can, you can see a lot and actually a, a great deal of detail right down to the horizon. So, um, you know, that's just sort of a brief overview of, um, of uh, how light pollution is within the Los Padres. This is fairly recent data. And one of the things I, um, I wanted to do was to just share some of you know, my favorite spots to do um, anything in the Los Padres, but in particular, you know, uh, night sky observing and astronomy. So of course, Mount Pinos has a, you can search, there's a, astronomy clubs will visit the Mount Pinos and have star parties. This is during one such star party, um, you know, the morning of just getting set up, set up. so I'm setting up my my gear over here, there's other people setting up this whole parking lot fills up with telescopes and astronomers and it's a great place to go. Just be sure to use your red headlight. Uh, this is, um, of course, painted rock campsite. This was in honor of uh, Craig Carey. Where did you sleep last night? And this was from a backpack, you have to backpack in here. So I left my telescope at home for this one. And then this is Figaro Mountain. This is a campsite there. I brought my telescope and you can actually use some reasonably good, uh, you know, this is of the night sky. And anywhere along the Sespe River, you know, it's you can just it's nice. You know, it's fairly wide open in a lot of areas, and then kind of the um, the sleeper is uh, the Gaviota Pier is a quite even though it's not in the Los Padres in particular. It's all, it's it's a great place to go for observing the uh, the Milky Way because you're looking straight out over the ocean if the nights are clear. And just to give you some resources, this is the um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a delegate to the International Dark Sky Association and. Uh, part of my mandate is to help you know share this awareness of of light pollution and sky glow. And if you go to the uh, their website darksky.org, you can see here. Um, I should have put that in the in the chat too, but it's darksky.org, and they have a bunch of resources. If you go to this link here, there's a bunch of public outreach materials, questions, publications, and all sorts of information to help answer your questions of what you could do. For example, you know what type of lights lighting fixtures can you have around your house and places of business and maybe in different municipalities to help um, reduce 
the effect of you know unwanted light just going up into the sky. And the other feature, uh, aspect of that is to use warm lights rather than the, the, the daylight or blue lights that really have that blue light component that's so damaging. So there's a bunch more stuff we could talk about here, but I just certainly wanted to take this opportunity to um, bring that up. So now let's get into the astronomy side of things and we'll see how far we get with this and, and how far we get. So we're gonna start off by talking about the uh, nightscapes or, or the, you know, the seasonal nightscapes. What can we see near the horizon to, for, for each of the different months? And I've indicated this as a constellation and a key star. I want to talk briefly about constellations because there's so many cool things. I wish we had, um, well, you know, if we were in a big enough group, we'd sort of gather around um, and I'd ask for a, sh I can't quite, there we go. Um, I'd sort of get, say, okay, show of hands. Anyone, does anyone recognize any of the stars here, any of the formations? Someone say, Mike, Mike, that's the big dipper. I'd say, you're right, that is the big dipper. And I would say, here it is, I've outlined it for you so you can see the, uh, Big Dipper turns in the United Kingdom. This is called the plow. It's kind of a neat thing. And the interesting thing is the Big Dipper itself is actually not a constellation. It's part of the constellation Ursa Major. So this is the Great Bear. You can see here the body of the Great Bear, the head, the tail, and the front, the back legs and the front legs. And so this is a constellation. So the, the thing I just wanted to point out, just so you know, is an asterism is it's an unofficial but recognizable grouping of stars. So that's something that's kind of cool, didn't know that. But it's a constellation, is, it's, it's an official thing. And it's an, and this is the thing that I, it may or may not, um, I, I didn't know when I first got into this. It just actually refers to an area of the sky around this particular grouping of stars. So what I mean by that is, this is the actual constellation of Ursa Major in the sky. And so each constellation is kind of like a city in a country. So you have, let's say, you know, oh, I don't know, you have Ventura, and then you have Ojai, and you have Santa Paula and Fillmore. And so each one of these is, you know, uh, a particular, has a particular boundary and everything within the boundary belongs to that city. And so for example, if you're interested in this particular, uh, look at that, the little red thing, it's called M81. What is that? What is M, what's M101? It's outlined in red. What are these little red things and these other different constellations? So the point is that those objects are, located in the sky within the boundaries of the constellation Ursa Major. So we use these constellations to actually um, navigate our way around the night sky, just like we navigate around one of Brian's uh, maps um, around the Los Padres. This is a photograph of the Eastern Sierra. You can see me standing up right here on this little, this little hill with my little headlight. And look at all these stars in the sky. You can see Perseus and Auriga and Taurus and Orion over here. Um, this was taken in February, uh, late February, or actually early February. You see the Andromeda galaxy. There it is, that galaxy we were talking about. And then down here, you can see the simulation of this image. And I'm going to talk briefly about ways to do this. It's using the Stellarium um, program, which is uh, you can download for free. That link is in the uh, chat. So you can go to the chat and look up stellarium.org. And the neat thing about this, this virtual pl uh, planetarium is that you can dial in any location and any date, you know, past, present, or future. And then you can kind of zoom in and zoom out of the night sky to frame up your image to see what's actually happening in this in the sky. And then you can um, actually click on individual objects and the, uh, and the program will tell you there's a, <laughs> a load of information about, you know, what is it, how far away is it, what type of thing is it, you know, that whole thing. So it's just a really, um, really powerful app. So I wanted to point that out. Now, I want to go through a couple of things that you may or may not be aware of when it comes to how the night sky works. And you know, I've given this talk to lots and lots of people, and I think there's always something here that, that you sort of like people go, oh, hmm, didn't know that. So here's what we got. We got the sun, we got the earth. And this white circle right here represents the earth's orbit around the sun. So it takes a year for the earth to complete an orbit. No big surprise there. It takes one full year for the earth to travel all the way around the circle. Now, during that time, it makes 365 little, you know, revolutions around its own axis. So it's spinning around, and what we're doing here is I've got the North Pole right in the center. So this is like a top-down view of the earth. We're looking down on the North Pole. We're ignoring the tilt for a minute. 
And what I've shown here is the side of the earth that faces the sun is experiencing daytime. Again, no big surprise. And the side of the earth that faces away from the sun is of course experiencing nighttime. That's just how it works. And so what that means though, of course, is the side of the earth that's experiencing nighttime is, is, is able to see these stars because that's what, they, that's what they're facing at night. Uh, and what's important to note here is that they are not seeing these stars. So here's where things kind of get interesting because, okay, so the sun is blocking our view of, of, the, uh, of these stars over here. So, you know, tomorrow, um, when, you know, at, at noon tomorrow, when we're looking outside and we can look in the direction of the sun, there's stars behind the sun. We just can't see them because the sunlight is causing the atmosphere to, uh, to become you know that blue color and uh, that, that blue light from the atmosphere the, uh, the gases in the atmosphere blocks the light the dimmer lights of the stars so that's fine um so in fact like we we're saying this the earth rotates you know once a day as no big surprise so what this means now if you look at this very carefully i put a little red dot on the point on the earth's surface that's just, just experiencing sunset so this is just the earth is you know the rotating counterclockwise so the Earth is so this is 6 p.m. local time. Um, and actually, I guess that would be uh, yeah, I guess that would be 6 p.m. local time. And so what happens? This is the view of the stars there. And then you know at midnight, th this is the view of the stars. And then you know just before morning, the people you're actually the Earth, your spot on the Earth is rotated all the way over here. And now you're looking over in this direction right before dawn. So you know during the course of a night. You know, when you, we've all probably seen time lapses like this, where you see, you know, the Milky Way moving across the night sky, star, here comes Mars, Mars is off on the left here. This was taken in the high Sierra uh, during um, Perseid meteor shower. And what's actually happening is the Earth is doing the rotating here. It's like we're on this revolving restaurant, like, you know, that restaurant over at LAX on the top of the tower that just spins in a circle. Uh, so the Earth is rotating and that's what's causing the, our view of the cosmos to shift. So, you know, right after sunset, we're looking in one direction of the, so we see these stars, but then as the night goes on, the earth is turning and it's turning. And now we can see the Milky Way, we can see Mars. So it's a kind of neat thing to realize that, you know, over a, the course of a given night, we can actually sweep out a pretty good portion of the universe. And there's more. So now check this out. We've got the, um, so we've got that. So we can see these are the stars we see at night. We don't see these stars during the day. But what happens during the course of a year? So look at this. So here we are in January, let's say. We're right here looking out into the this region of the, of, the, of space at night. But three months later, look at this. We've moved all the way over here. So now we're looking at a totally different region of the, of the, uh, of the cosmos. Um, so in January, when we look at these stars at night, and we, again, we don't see these stars, Three months later, we're looking in a completely different portion of the night sky. We're looking all the way over here. And, you know, it's just a complete, we see something completely different. So as we go around the year, this is why, you know, month to month to month to month, what we see during the year just constantly changes. And just as one example of this, here's the same view with the same camera, the same lens, looking same direction at the same time. I'm looking east at midnight in October. And I see Orion. If I do the same thing a few months later, I don't see Orion at all. I see the Milky Way. So it's crazy. I mean, this is just one of the cool things about, you know, night photography and observing from within the Los Padres or anywhere that your view constantly, constantly changes. And, you know, it all has to do with how the Earth itself is orbiting or, ro or rotating and as how it orbits. Here's another interesting thing that I think you might find interesting. <laughs> if it's interesting, it would be. And it goes something like this. So here's the sun, again, at the center of the universe. Now, check this out. So here is the Earth at four-month intervals. So May, September, and January. Now, as we said, at May, at night, at the, you know, the nighttime view of the, of the Earth, when you're on Earth, looks out and you can see the constellation, say, Libra. But during the daytime, the sun is blocking your view of the constellation Aries. That's fine. Four months later, when you're all the way over here in September, your nighttime view is of the constellation Aquarius, but the uh, the daytime view is the sun is blocking your view of Leo. And same thing in January at night, you can see Gemini, but you can't see Sagittarius. And here's the thing: if let's look at the instance of January, 
So in the month of January, when the sun, when the Earth is here, uh, if you could temporarily turn off the sun and switch off its light, you'd be able to see the stars behind it. You'd be able to see the stars of Sagittarius because they're right behind the sun. It's just the sun's in the way. And if you think back to our description of what are what is a constellation? It's an area of the sky. It's a boundary that within that boundary, um, everything within that boundary is inside that constellation. So what we would say at this time of at when the Earth is right here in, in January, we would say that the Sun is in the constellation of Sagittarius, and that's where these sun signs come from. You know, that's where the signs of the zodiac come from. It's like where is, as the Earth travels around the Sun during the course of the year the projection of the sun into the constellation behind it are the signs of the zodiac. That's the ecliptic. That's why the, um, th that's why we have our sun signs. So when we talk about like Mars entering a constellation and Mars is going into Virgo or Mars is going into Taurus, it's crossing from one boundary into the other. And uh, it's funny because you might think that, well, at that time of year, when you look out at night, you'd see that particular constellation, but it just doesn't work that way. So anyway, it's kind of an interesting thing. And like I say, here's the, um, here is the uh, the program Stellarium that I'd encourage you to uh, download. It's a free app like, or free program. Like I said, I think it's a modest charge to view it on your phone. Um, and of note, this is a Stellarium uh, prediction for uh, tonight. And if you're not aware of this, over the next several nights, the, um, the planet Mars is going to be moving right past the these little clusters, little star cluster called the Pleiades. And this is the, uh, you know, the seven sisters. This is the, uh, uh, I have a Subaru and this is the logo of the Subaru, you know, those little seven, you know, those stars. And it's a great example of how the planets actually move noticeably through the sky. I mean, the stars never move. The stars are fixed, but the word planet actually comes from uh, moving wandering star. So the, um, so this is some, this is a sort of thing you can get out of, uh, out of looking at um, looking at this, I think what I want to do right now is I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I want to talk to you about the Milky Way because I just there's something about this that I really want to um, to share with you because I think this is this is another one of my favorite topics about this. And this is again, how does it relate to uh, night sky viewing in the Los Padres? So here's what we got: uh, month of the year. Can we see the Milky Way core? And you know, in the winter time, no, we can't see that. But in the summertime, yes. And I want to talk about why that is. So here we have the Milky Way. There it is, artist schematic. Of course, we've never been outside of it. It's impossible. And for all intents and purposes, we can treat that as a pizza. So we've got this giant pizza that represents the Milky Way. And what I want to do is imagine that we're going to cut the pizza in half. So we're going to make a, a transverse section. We're going to cut that Milky Way right in half like this. And this is the central thing is, is actually, these are actual photographs that the, um, again, are supplied by NASA. You can download these, are kind of a cool thing to just download and study. And, you know, when we look at this central band of the Milky Way, I just want to emphasize it's a cross section of the, uh, of the Milky Way. Now it's actually, it's a little, this is a, kind of a simplification. So I know there's, um, uh, it, 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 I'm recognizing it's a simplification, but it's a pretty darn good simplification. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So anyway, so we have this, uh, this region of the Milky Way. I just want to spend some time and, 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 and just examine this for a minute. So here we are, there's the Milky Way. And I, I want to come into this middle part of the Milky Way. I want to zoom in on that because this is the galactic core region of the Milky Way. The, the center of the Milky Way is right about where I've got my cursor. At that point, there's a super massive black hole whose enormous gravitational force pulls, keeps everything anchored into the Milky Way. Everything is rotating around this. This is the hub of the bicycle wheel. This is the center of the pizza. That's the galactic core of the Milky Way. What I want to do now is I want to make a connection to that with this image that we started off with from the Los Padres. And so as you can see here, you can see the Milky Way, you can see uh, you know, the Pedro Blanca rocks I lit up with my headlight. So let's go back to this and now let's just try something kind of fun. Let's just you know, start to slowly bring in the image from Pedro. Look at that, it matches up. How interesting is that? There it is, let's go back to that. Wait a minute, what's going on there? So there's the central region of the Milky Way. Look at that. It's like a little window of the actual Milky Way. And in fact, you can, when we zoom out a little bit, we can do the same thing. 
And look at that. How interesting is that? So the, when we were looking at the, when my camera was capturing that region of the Milky Way, it was actually capturing that region of the Milky Way. And I know it sounds a little bit um, you know, obvious, but it, it's just mind boggling that that is the case. And in fact, so what happens is this is the region, this part within the oval is the region of the, uh, of the central band of the Milky Way that's visible in the Los Padres during the summertime. But curiously, that's not visible at all in the wintertime. This, the regions off to either side are. I wanna just maybe uh, wrap things up. I wanna take some questions here, uh, but I wanna just you know, wrap up on this point because it's so interesting. And so if we think about a pizza and a pizza cutter uh, analogy for a Milky Way, it turns out that the, sol the sun and the solar system you can think of that's the, the pizza cutter and the Milky Way itself is the pizza. You'll never look at a pizza again the same way, I, I guarantee it. So simplifying this, the solar system, and this is the interesting thing, it's not exactly, this is again a simplification, but the sun and the solar system is almost at right angles to the Milky Way. It's, I had no idea this was the case when I first started studying this. And in fact, if you think about the sun and the solar system as I've shown here, roughly how it is, the earth is more or less as I've shown it in this diagram. If you look here, the earth is on this side of the sun in December, it's up here in March, it's over here in June, and it's down here in September. That has big ramifications for what we see because at night, remember we, we can only see at night when we're facing away from the sun. In the winter time, we're facing out here. The sun is in the way of the galactic core, but look at this. In the summertime, look what we see, the beautiful galactic core of the Milky Way. And this is why right now we are just beginning to come up on Milky Way season. We're right up here in March. And for the next six months, it's prime Milky Way viewing season. So this is the time to really start planning out your um, Milky Way viewing uh, expeditions. And I, I put this diagram in, I don't know if this helps or not, but it's really kind of an interesting thing because as I say, this is the uh, galactic core of the Milky Way. And you know, if we zoom in on that, uh, we have the galactic core right there. We know that we can superimpose that photograph of the Los Padres right there. So what that means is that's the galactic core of the Milky Way that we can see from the Los Padres National Forest. I mean, how cool is that? So when we look, when, you, when we're in the Los Padres admiring the summer Milky Way, you can look at this and you're appreciating that you are an astronaut, you are looking your view of this is no different than if you were in space, you're, except the, you know, you got the atmosphere a little bit, but you're looking directly at the center of the Milky Way, the galactic core region of the Milky Way. And uh, that's, that's a little bit mind boggling. So when you see these kind of uh, single images like this, there's just so much more in there that um, the meets the eye. So here's what we've got. Um, you know, I could talk a little bit about the moon. I could talk a little bit about the photography, but I've been talking for a while. So I'd like to kind of come back and see if we have uh, questions that we can uh, answer or if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. So I'm just gonna open it up to you. So please fire away. Hi, Mike, can you hear Hello. me? I can hear Hi. you. Yeah, hey, Mike, my name is Mike as well. Hey, right, thank Mike. you for this. Um, so regarding the, the, like photographing the Milky Way. Yes. I'm planning to go up to Carrizo Plain in a couple of weeks. Great idea. And, and I, I'm real new at astrophotography, so thank you for this info. I Googled something on photographing the Milky Way and it gave me some hours that it said it's visible. It's like when my dates that I'm going up there, it's like two in the morning, something like that. So watch out for a guy driving a white Subaru coming out of Grizzo Plain <laughs> following days because I'm gonna be wicked tired. So I'm not gonna be seeing the core, but I'm gonna see like part of the Milky Way Great question, Mike. Let me. That's that's a great, great question. No, you're 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 going to see the real thing. And uh, so, what's going to happen here is, um, let me find uh, this this slide. Let me go back to my um, screen sharing. The there we go. So you're going to. What's going to happen is this part right here that I'm indicating is going to slowly. It's going to sort of rise above the eastern horizon. So you're going to be aiming to the east. And um, because of where we are in the Earth's orbit, I'm going to see if I can find 
find that uh, that particular graphic. Um, boy, where did that thing go? Um, well, that's very curious. Uh, because of where we are in the Earth's orbit, I'll just uh, just say it in words. Oh, it's over here. Um, here we go. Let's go to this one. Uh, so you're right now, I mean, literally right now, we are right here. This is where the Earth is. And it's like inching, it takes, you know, three months. These, these little circles are three months apart. So if you can imagine this, this, this yellow triangle aiming up as it, as the yellow triangle, again, it's everything's rotating counterclockwise. As it slowly rotates to the left, right before we experience daytime, you can catch a glimpse of this part of the Milky Way. All right. So what that means is, yes, you're going to see this part of the Milky Way coming up in the east before dawn, and then it's going to continue to rise into the sky, but the sun's going to rise behind it and block the view. Um, but since you're talking about this, let me just say that, um, oh, I don't want to rush through the, the, the camera setting stuff too fast, but, you know, the in brief, you know, the basic setup, for, you know, for, we maybe elaborate on this in a subsequent one, but the basic here for, for Milky Way photography or any type of photography is a camera, a lens, ball head, and a tripod. And the key thing that, as well as, a, of course, a red um, headlight, but the key thing that you want to have is the ability to manually focus and manually expose your camera. Um, those are the key things. And then once you've got your, you know, you're out there, you got your composition set up, this is what are generally viewed as sort of like the golden triangle of, ex of night photography exposure settings. And this is a good place to start, especially in the Carrizo plane where it's totally dark. You might even want to go with an ISO of 6,400, um, a shutter speed of 20 seconds, and an aperture of, of let's say even f2.8. But, you know, this, this is the, the right sort of, um, uh, you know, exposure settings to, uh, to to get you started with that. But a very, very jealous, Mike, of your trip out to Carrizo Plains next in a, in a couple of weeks. So definitely keep us posted with that one. All right. Thank you. You bet. What are some of the other projects that people might have in mind? Uh, trying to stop those oil flares. It looked like the oil flares is the brightest thing in the country. If you take them each city on its own, it looked like the oil flares was actually bigger than even Los Angeles. Yeah, it's, you know, it's Aria. Yeah, I, it's amazing, isn't it? Because the, um, you know, the amount of light that is just uh, to lost into space is is kind of staggering. And um, this is this really is a, you know, it's just like everything else, like gasoline, uh, you, know, you know, plastics. You know, it's just one more thing that uh, we are, you know, consuming and emitting and, and dumping into the environment. And the interesting thing, one of the interesting things, I guess the positive thing about, uh, you know, sky glow and light pollution is that it's instantly reversible, that by... You know, switching off the lights, there's no like, uh, there's, it, it, the atmosphere immediately clears up. It's like during a solar eclipse, when the moon eclipses the sun, you can see the stars. I mean, there's no lag. It doesn't take a while for the energy to dissipate. It's an instantaneous thing. It's like during the North, Northridge earthquake back in the, in the early 1990s. I mean, people were like, what's this thing in the sky? And it's the Milky Way because once the lights went out in, North, in, that, in, the, you know, in the valley there, um, you can all of a sudden see these stars in the Milky Way and people, it really caught people by surprise. It's an instantaneous effect. So that to me is one positive aspect about it by taking these steps. You know, you don't have to wait, you know, 50 years or 100 years to flush it out of the, the environment. It just immediately leaves the environment. Hi, Mike. Hey, Alexis. You can see us. So... Uh, I've got a question. So you're, you you mentioned gaviota pier, and it sounds very intriguing. And I'm guessing that right about now is really not the primo time to go and check out gaviota to get a Milky Way image over the ocean, which has been on my hit list for a long time, but has never happened. Um, 
might that be a, might there be a better time of the year to make that happen like june or something like that and then ed has a question after i'm done <laughs> no that's a great question and you're you're quite right i mean it, when you're looking south over the pacific ocean when the milky way comes up right now it's going to come up in the east which of course is going to be in the glare of la so um i would think that yeah june and august in particular you'd be looking more to the south and to the west and of course there's nothing out there so um but you never know i mean it's 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 pretty dark there and uh, the milky way is it's pretty it's a pretty large thing so especially as it rises high in the sky I, I, I wouldn't necessarily wait until June to give it your first go, but it's, I also know it's a little bit of a drive. Um, always good to scout it out, right? Always good to scout it out, <laughs> exactly. So so I've always been looking at Mount Figueroa. Is, have you ever been to Figueroa? Yeah, I've camped up there with my telescope. And, and oh, Ooh. so it's good for like the deep sky stuff. Yes. But I always feared there'd be like, uh, light pollution on the horizon or is that there is i mean compared to some of the dark spots that you know we've been to but it's it's not terrible and when you're above the horizon then you can have access to the sky as well so i wouldn't i wouldn't place figure i mean the nice thing it, it, there's always a contrast between or a, a competition between you know altitude and proximity for you know to, to to cities and stuff so one of the things you've got there is you're above the haze you know more so than say the Sespe River, um, but you're right. I mean, you do have you know the there's there's a lot of you know cities relatively nearby that are going to cause you know some especially along the horizon. So it's better for deep like if I wanted to image uh, Andromeda or something like that. It, yeah, it would be a good spot. I I would say so. Yeah, I mean it's, it's I'm I'm offering it as a uh, as a potential spot to check out. Because um, I, I was able to see quite a few things, as I recall. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you for that. It's good to see you too. <laughs> Great to see you too. Yeah. More questions. I have a question. Fire away. Have you ever seen an app called Photo Pills? Ken's asking if we've ever run into an app called Photo Pills. Is that the question? Well, yeah, that's part one. I, I use it and it, uh, for Mike, it'll give you like the, the line to the Milky Way and give you the exact time of when it comes up, when the galactic center is visible, and then when it goes down. And I find this useful because you can put like the, the pin on your location, like say you wanted to do painted rock you could put the pin on it and then it will point you in the exact direction for that. You know, you're absolutely right. And in fact, um, let's see here. So they, uh, to, to reiterate what Ken is saying, I, I wanna amplify that and I wholeheartedly agree that uh, there are, there's three apps that you might want to explore um, for helping you planning your, your night photography. Uh, the, the one that Ken mentioned is called Photo Pills. Uh, the, the original one is called the Photographer's Ephemeris, E-P-H-E-R-I-M-I-S. If I can type that into the chat, maybe towards the end, I'll try to do that. And then the one that I actually am using the most these days is called Planet Pro. And it's not like planet like Mars, but it's like plan it. So it's P-L-A-N-I-T. Um, and in fact, if you go to my website, I'm going to, you know, maybe what I'll do right now is I'm just going to jump over to... Um, a couple of resources that you might find helpful. Let me do this now uh, because Ken's exactly right about this. So let me share my screen. So if you go to, so this is a, a screen grab from my website and it's mikeshawphotography.com, super easy. And if you go to over here where it says learn and you click on this link, there's gonna be a, if you come down to the pull down menu, there's a, a thing called planet how to videos. And I've actually collaborated with the Planet developers. And if you go to the app itself and there's a little help button, a little question mark, if you click on that, you're going to hear a bunch of <laughs> my voice as their, uh, you know, YouTube, as their, as their how-to videos. It's a great app. Um, but then it's, it's a Planet app. And then the, uh, um, I thought I'd throw this in there too. This is the, if, by the way, if we're not connected on, you know, Instagram and, oops, I, I, I don't think I shared that, did I? Let's go back to that. Oops. 
So I apologize if that didn't come across. So it's this link right here. You go to learn and you click on the learn link and then there's a pull down menu that has the, um, that has the, the planet uh, uh, videos. And also just, uh, you know, if we're not already connected on Instagram or YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, I'm mostly active on Instagram and, and Twitter. Uh, sometimes a little bit on Facebook, but you know, Instagram and Twitter is, is where I'm, I'm doing most of my stuff. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there uh, before, uh, before we run out of time. But, um, but yeah, Ken, you're absolutely right. So Mike, I would, yeah, if you have any questions about um, the, uh, where were the apps? So, you know, uh, <laughs> let me, you know, let me just take a moment here since people are curious about that. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to post a link in the chat real quick, just so you can see that. And uh, here we go. So I'm going to copy that, come down to the paste. Yeah. Okay. So I just clicked, uh, I just added a link to the um, planet YouTube videos uh, in the chat for the, for the present here, for the zoom uh, in the zoom chat. So if you can click on that link, that'll take you. And yeah. And Mike, I would really encourage you to investigate these because it's, it's, I mean, that's a whole separate presentation on how to use planning apps to, you know, precisely line up the Milky Way, you know, nebulae, star clusters, stars, constellations, the whole works. I mean, it's just incredible. So Ken, thanks for pointing that out. And Mike? Yes. Yeah, David. Um, one thing on the Gaviota Pier, you know, the Gaviota Pier is actually closed off, fenced off, and it was damaged in some storms a couple of years ago. But, okay. um, Mike, so are you going to go over shooting the, uh, like a full moon? I, I'm like just beginning at a lot of this stuff, but I'm intrigued with the full moon type. Absolutely. I mean, so the, uh, <laughs> the quick answer is yes. Let me just briefly say a few words to that. I think we might be running up against a time window, so I don't. I want to be respectful of people's time. Um, but the the full moon is actually one of the most difficult objects to shoot, and um, to, I think the, a full treatment of that's going to be a, a different presentation. But let me just go through. Uh, well, let me just let me just walk you through uh, the points with this. So, what I would say for shooting the full moon is, you have the day of the full moon, and then you have the day before the full moon and the day after the full moon. And what you might find is the best day to photograph the full moon is actually the day in the evening, the day before the full moon. So, like I think the full moon this last weekend was Sunday. The best time to photograph that would have been Saturday as the full moon was rising. And the reason for that is that it rises a little bit before it gets completely dark. And you're able to match the brightness of the moon with the brightness of the foreground because the moon has the full illumination of the sun on it. So it's high noon on the moon and the foreground, I mean, the sun just set, so it's pretty dark. But when it's close to the horizon, the moon's brightness is diminished by all the atmosphere it has to travel through so you can actually get, there's actually like about a 20 minute window, believe it or not, when everything is just right. And then after the moon gets a little bit higher and it gets darker, it moons too bright, foreground's too dark, too early, it's moon's not bright enough, but it's a tricky game. But um, so I would say as a, just a ballpark scenario, I try to look the day before and then as the moon is setting in the morning of the day after the full moon. I think I saw that Nick, yeah, you bet, David. Thank you. I think I saw that Nick had a question. I'll come on there for a sec. Could be wrong. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm in the midst of uh, trying to cook dinner here while watching your <laughs> <laughs> watching your webinar. But um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your technique for star trails. Definitely. So star trails, super fun project. So the key is, uh, you know, one of the first questions people have is, um, you know, how, how many images do you have to, you know, so let me back up a step. So the, there's two main ways of capturing a star trails image. The first is to, in a single exposure, just open up your camera's aperture and open up your shutter and let the camera expose images for let's say an hour or two hours. And then you close the shutter. So you have a one continuous star trail image. 
And that certainly works. That's how people would make star trail images in the days of film. It really wasn't in any other way. The downside to that is that if anything that emits light walks through the scene during that process, that is also part of that image. So if a headlight walks through or a car drives through or something like that, but that's certainly a way to go. But it's, it's generally not the way that most people make star trails now. The, the most common way that you'll find is people will take a series of um, successive images, let's say 20 seconds a piece. So uh, you might collect you know, a couple thousand, well, let's say several hundred 20 second images. And then you'll use, a, a, let's say, a free program like Starstax, S-T-A-R-S-T-A-X. Let me type that in. So I'll type in star trails. Uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to tab along S T, whoops, T A R, whoops, S T, I kind of flunked typing star stacks. If you Google star stacks, I just type that into the chat. Uh, it'll take you to a free program where you can take your series, your several hundred images, and then you put them into the star stacks program. And what it does is really neat is it compares each image with the preceding image. So image after image after image after image. And it only keeps the part that's um, that's light. So if you have two images of the same thing, and the only thing that's changed is a star has moved and left a little trail, it only keeps that little trail. So it actually plucks each of those little star trails from each of the images and then assembles them so that the foreground doesn't get you know overwhelmingly bright. And uh, it's a really neat program. Back to the question of how do you get the images in the first place, the easiest way is to you know, if your camera has a programmable intervalometer, you can program that to capture a sequence of images. You can also turn into a time-lapse video. Um, or you can take a, a shutter release, um, like this one here, just a regular, uh, you know, mechanical shutter release. Some of these will have a locking button on them. And then you attach your shutter release to the camera you put your camera in a continuous drive mode. So it's like paparazzi mode. So, you know, it's like when you're, you know, shooting, you know, Elvis, you know. So it's in a continuous shooting mode, let's say a 10, 10 or 20 second exposure. You attach this, you press the, press the, the shutter release. So you release the shutter, but then you lock it like that. So it stays down. And what that does is it forces the camera to just take seek photograph after photograph after photograph until you unlock it like that, or you take this off or your battery dies or, you, or your memory card fills up. That's a great way to collect a series of images. You know, it requires zero thought and you can set that up to run and it'll run, you know, for hours and hours and hours. The key thing for, to my recommendation for a, a successful star trails image is to run for something like um, at least an hour or two, preferably three or four hours. It's a real time commitment. And this is why the planning really takes place because once you've got your composition, you can't sort of adjust it halfway or, you know, you, you take your shot, ah, oh, dang it, I wish I'd gone over here or something like that. So it uh, requires a certain amount of planning, but it's, 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 it's not difficult. And once you get the hang of it, it's kind of addictive. So uh, watch out for that. So for that, Mike, you recommend, you said like 20 seconds? I, I, that's my sort of ball, that's a, a good starting point for a wide angle lens, like a, 24 millimeter lens or a 14 right. millimeter or something like that. You can try 10 seconds if you find this. Oh, and th there's one more advantage to having a series of short, shorter uh, shutters, uh, shorter shutter speeds like that. And a good example is I was, you know, a few years ago, I was doing a, uh, a star trail image in, in New Mexico on a workshop and, uh, you know, halfway through the start, halfway through the, halfway through the sequence, this huge fireball came blazing through the sky and I was able to capture that on a single exposure. Now, if I was just running a continuous star trail image, it would have been part of that star trail image, but it would have not been a meteor image by itself. But because I was doing the sequence of images, because I had this one image with this one meteor, I was able to, I was able to include that in the star trail image, but then also take that and do other things with that image just by itself. So the choice of, the reason for bringing that up is the choice of uh, shutter speeds that you might want to use. I would choose that so that each image could be sort of a standalone image just by itself. I know that we haven't talked a lot about, if hardly at all about the photography side of this. I think we I ran a little bit out of time, but um, 
but I hey, hope that those those comments help. Hey, hey, Mike, this is Alexis. I, I hope you're going yeah. to, going to do uh, subsequent versions of this because there's so much detail. That shot that you you uh, showed of uh, the moon rising over Chesbro Canyon. We mm -hmm. live we live sort of near that area. Were you just happening to be driving down the freeway and said, "Oh, golly gosh, wow, look <laughs> at that moon!" And there's a tree. And what focal length did you use? <laughs> oh, you're like, that's a good one. So this is a great question. So I, again, if we were in a group, what I would ask everyone to do is, if you wouldn't mind humor me and with your obviously you know most of the most if not all the videos are off but just if you were to hold out your thumb and your forefinger and alexis i'm not putting you on the spot or anything but, you, but how how big do you think the moon is and if you so if you hold your hand out at arm's length it turns out that it is um i found from my experience that the site yeah it's a it's the size of the moon is about half the width of my pinky of the fingernail on my on my pinky finger so it's only about three or four millimeters in diameter at arm's length. It's really pretty small. So I spend a lot of times driving around holding my little finger up like, is that the right size for a good moonshot? And I saw this, this tree. I thought that would be a pretty good one. So anyway, the, the make a long story short, on that particular night, I used one of the planning apps and I put a pin on the, on, so these apps work by, they give you an aerial map. And I, Put a pin on the tree and I rode my mountain bike because I had to like ride over to the tree because there was a lot of trees and I had to ride over to the tree. I, here I am. I'm going to put a pin right here. I then rode my mountain bike down the trail, down the trail, down the valley, up the other side of the valley, up and up along the other ridge, on the other side of the ridge now. And I moved along the ridge until I knew the moon would come up behind that pin. And it was a 200 millimeter uh, lens. And then it came up right now. I was like, it was, it's, it's so satisfying because you know, you can see the the horizon's getting lighter and lighter. All of a sudden, that very first top of the moon comes up, and it's like, yeah, it's right behind the. It, oh, I have to move like a couple of feet, and it just just slowly, silently moves behind the tree. Oh, it's just a magical thing. Thank you. So yeah, a transcendental moment. <laughs> it was. It was really. It was so satisfying Thank because you. you know. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mike, another like moon question. Sure. Yeah. I noticed, I don't know, maybe it was in January, out walking a dog, crescent moon was around, it was probably about an hour, maybe an hour and a half after sunset. And a crescent moon was a, a really cool orange. And I was thinking, wow, I wish I had my camera, I wish I was somewhere planned for this. It would have been a great crescent moon shot. Is that predictable? Like if I look at, the moon phase and sunset will I will, will that always kind of appear where we would see like a setting crescent moon an hour after sunlight or, or sunset have an orange glow to it for 20 minutes is, is there something predictable like that or was I just like happen to look up and there it was and <laughs> now I gotta wait another year no, I'm loving it. I'm only laughing because I had exactly that question. And um, so here's a, here's an example. Uh, so I think you can see that at a crescent moon, yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay, so something like this. And it's very predictable. So if you look at this moon phase calendar, this is one of the things we can talk about at length. You'll see here that the moon undergoes a series of moon phases on a roughly 28 day, 30 day cycle. So here's a full moon and there's a waning gibbous moon and so forth. And on the what you want to do, Mike, is to, to next next month or this month is uh, in about a, in about two weeks, we're going to have the new moon. And then the three or four days after that new moon is when the thing that you saw happens. Only happens in the evening, three or four nights out of the whole month. And uh, because you're facing in the direction of sunset, when that happens, the sky is often an orange color. So that part's pretty straightforward. But I would say, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, let's, here's, oh, let me make an on the fly prediction for you. So here we are. And um, 
we're going to go up here. I'm using one of my app. I'm using the Planet app actually right now. I'm looking at the calendar. Whoops, I was doing something else. So let's go back to today. So today is Wednesday, March 3rd. Okay, so the new moon in March of 2021, the new moon is a week from Saturday. Is next is the 13th. The 13th. So I would say Monday the 15th, Tuesday the 16th, Wednesday the 17th are your nights. Send me an email okay. and let me know how that goes. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, so so depending on the sky condition, obviously, that west. setting moon. Now there's a time window for that, right? Oh, thank you for that. That was my other slide. I mean, yeah, that's so. really the, the, that that's really the question. Not so much the phase as the moon, but it's like the the time that I'm really going to see that is going to be a certain time following sunset. Correct. So what I've got here is a graph. This is out, out of one out of my first book. And what this shows is it goes from midnight to midnight. And then it shows the phase of the moon. I've outlined the full moon here in this instance, but you can see the moon, the moon phase and then when it rises and then when it sets. And it all has to do with how the the, the moon goes around the uh, around the earth. But you see here, this is a, a waxing crescent moon. So that's this one right here. And so it rises at around nine in the morning and it sets around 9 p.m. And what you want to remember is the moon sets on the order of somewhere between a half hour to an hour later each day. So if the moon sets at eight o'clock tonight, it's going to set at 845 tomorrow night and 930 the next night and 1015 the night after, roughly something like that. So each night, it's, so these are, um, you know, sort of uh, three or four days apart on, in this particular instance. So you know, it, it's, you know, each, the difference in time here is, uh, is, is like three times, three times that. So hopefully this, I, I think, I think that helps with, with your question. I think, yeah. And I get like 12 months to like practice it. Right. <laughs> well, that's the thing. And that's, I get I 36 it's... chances and from now until next mid-March. <laughs> right. And, but that's, I, I'm glad you said that because I think that to me is what's so motivating about, about, you know, understanding why all of this stuff happens. You know, why does, you know, you know, why does the, why do we have moon phases? Why do we see the Milky Way only? I mean, if you, if we go back to the Milky Way example that um, I think that was you, Mike, wasn't it? It was, you're going to go out to Carrizo Plains. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it, let's say that there's six months out of the year when the Milky Way is in a position where you can photograph it. Well, of those six months, you really want to shoot those. You only really want to do that when the moon is, is not above the horizon. So that's a new moon phase. So that's really only one week out of those four months. So out of those six months, there's only um, six weeks. And, of the, so there's, and if you only can get out on a weekend, that's only six weekends. And you know, if you shoot both weekend nights, that's 12, 12 nights out of the entire year, <laughs> you could photograph the Milky Way. So yeah, I really, I think the, 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 one of the points I, I really like to stress is it's kind of like if you, if you go to a sports stadium to watch a game, but you don't even check to see if anyone's playing. I mean, it's, it's kind of like that with, with planning the, uh, with planning the, all of these things is that if you, if you, um, if you, if you make a plan and, uh, you know, have a sense of what's going to happen in what time, then you will get the shot. There's no question about it. Um, and that's what's so, I think, valuable about it. So I'm glad you made that point. And that's a really cool analogy. Good. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. Thank you. Yeah, God, I'm glad that, you know, it's, it's, it's so true because, I mean, all of us have gone out to all sorts of things in nature and been completely skunked. And it's kind of heartbreaking when people go out to shoot the Milky Way in November and it's like, they, they want to get this shot. And it's like, no, that's, that's six months from now is what you're looking for there. So, um, but then if you, go out six months and there it's going to be. And, you know, it's like watching the moon come up. It, it's entirely predictable. All of these things happen with regularity. The only thing that's unpredictable is a meteor shower, is, is the meteors during, a, is, is just a meteor in general. And then the aurora borealis. It's like, you can, you can stack the deck in your favor, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, a thing. And the weather. And the weather. <laughs> and then you have the family and then you have the work and then you have your, your personal stuff. So. Um, but yeah, thanks. Hey, Kendra. 
Hey, Mike, I just want to say thank you so much for all the info. I feel like there's so much more that we could talk about, and I hope to bring you back for a, a future session um, where we could perhaps go into more detail about the photography specifics. Um, but uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, we are going to be sending out the recording of this session um, uh, via email. So look, check for that tomorrow. We're also going to be putting it on our LPFA YouTube channel, um, which we would love for you to subscribe to. So check us out on YouTube. Um, we'll be on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And especially to uh, Dr. Mike Shaw, we're so uh, blessed that you could join us. Um, for this great presentation. And uh, I learned a lot. I know others did too. And I'm excited to keep learning more about this subject. It's so exciting and fascinating. So thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, uh, Brian and everybody. Uh, it's good to see some old friends and make some new ones. And if you have any uh, question, then you can um, then uh, uh, just send me an email at mike at mikeshawphotography.com. But thanks so much again. It's really been a pleasure and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. It was Thank great. Thank, thanks, Mike. It was awesome. Thank you very much. All right, good to see you, Alexis and Ned. Thanks. Good to see you, too. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Cheers. You, too. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye, Kendra. Thanks again. Okay.